The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. When is $46 billion not enough? If this week is any indication, and the answer to that question is when Canadian healthcare needs a transformative new deal. We'll explore that tonight. Then, from our Ontario hubs, how investigations are conducted into unmarked graves at sites near former residential schools. And from how to talk to young people about anti-black racism to keeping kids safe from online exploitation, we've got The Agenda's Week in Review. It's Friday, February 10th, and that's all ahead on The Agenda. This week, the federal government put forth its proposal to the provinces for a new health care funding model. It's a big deal, not just because it's always a big deal, but also because three plus years of pandemic have stretched existing health care to and beyond its limits. With us for more in Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island, Dr. Michael Gardham, board chair of Healthcare Can and CEO of Health PEI. And in the nation's capital, Marika Walsh, senior political reporter for The Globe and Mail. Welcome to you both. Thanks. Hi. All right, so Marika, let's start off with sort of the, the numbers. Let's crunch the numbers here. How much money is the federal government offering the provinces and territories? It depends on which envelope you're looking at. In terms of the new money, what's different from what we knew in advance, the federal government's offering about $46 billion in new money over the next 10 years. That is on top of a significant base spending that the provinces and territories were already expecting, but it's far short of what they were asking for in terms of addressing the crisis in the healthcare system and what they said was needed to address that. Now, Marika, in terms of reaction, words have been used as lukewarm, maybe not exactly like you mentioned the, the money there. How have the provincial and territorial leaders responded so far to this offer? I would say that the overall vibe is a resigned acceptance. They know that it wasn't a negotiation with the federal government. They got an offer. They got essentially a spending announcement from the federal government when the premiers came to Ottawa this week. And so if they say no, they just don't get the money. So of course they're going to say yes. But certainly everything that they said showed that they were expecting much more from the expectations that the government was setting in advance of this meeting than they ended up getting. But given that they will take any money, they'll take this money as well. All right, Michael, um, I'm going to quote uh, Andre Picard, health columnist for Global Mail, friend of our program here. Um, he wrote, it's hard to believe that two and a half years of public posturing and background negotiations produced something so utterly uninspiring and unimaginative. Is that a fair assessment of this offer? Yeah, I mean, I, I usually end up agreeing with Andre, to be honest. <laughs> I think that, you know, as... as as I think my own premier said, you know, the money is great. We'll take whatever it is you can you can give us. But I think fundamentally, and Andre said this in his article as well, we actually have to get into the business of fundamentally reforming Canadian healthcare. And I personally, and I think Healthcare Can believes, we will suck up whatever money you give us, but really that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for fundamental reforms of the Canadian healthcare system. And we don't just want to keep slapping new coats of paint on a very rundown house. We have to have the hard conversations around what we do. Some of that will be money, but we have to talk about what we do next to make a new Canadian healthcare system. All right, I wanna go back tw about 20 years ago, uh, also a liberal government. Uh, Michael, how is this offer different from the one signed in 2004 by Paul Martin's government? I mean, it, it really is quite quite similar in a way, right? We're we're continuing to you know fund the status quo, but we have to go back and look at what Canadian healthcare was when we when we created our public healthcare system. It was basically hospital costs and doctor's fees, and that was a time before we had ICUs and MRIs and all of these uh, special cancer drugs, and it goes on and on and on and on and on. And all of these big funding announcements have been to try to prop up the existing system or add more things to it. But we've never gone back and actually challenged the fundamental principles about what we're doing here and, and whether we can possibly afford to fund everything that people think we should have. So in a way, it's just adding more money to the, to the pile, but it's not really getting us to the point where we have to have the hard conversations. Marika, does this offer come with strings? 
So if I could just back up a little bit to tee off some of what Michael was saying, because I think there are some really important points here. And the question is also who is responsible for those conversations mm -hmm. around the structure? I think I'll, the federal government in itself might have hurt itself by talking about sort of this massive influx they were going to put into the system. They were talking about changing the healthcare system. They were talking about fixing a broken system. Those were their words. And so then, of course, they set the expectation that we would see some sort of response to that. But the premiers are not looking to Ottawa to come up with new ideas and to innovate in their 13 healthcare systems. We don't right. have one healthcare system in Canada. Right. And so I think it's also a question of organizations like Michael's are rightly saying there needs to be change, there needs to be structural reform. But is Ottawa the government that should be doing that? And I think many people would say no, because they are not the ones that are hold the power, the levers on the system. And so people are looking to Ottawa for answers, but at the same time, Ottawa is not necessarily the best place to do that. And the premiers are not asking Ottawa to do that. They actually have made it very clear in these talks that you asked me about that they do not want Ottawa telling them what to do or how mm -hmm. to run their system. There can be a debate on whether or not that is appropriate or whether the federal government should have more say in the matter, but how it's set up right now, it doesn't. And to your question on, on conditions, the strings attached, that's exactly where the rubber hits the road. The federal government appears to have decided not to put in a massive injection of cash beyond what it's already promised in the last election, but at the same time, it's not putting any consequences for that spending. So yes, there are conditions in terms of where that money can be spent, but there doesn't appear to be consequences for if a result isn't reached or if the money doesn't lead to better outcomes or shorter wait times. Michael, should there be conditions or consequences or should the provinces and territories spend their money as see fit? You know, that's the that's the big tragedy of of Canadian healthcare is that we've spent the last 60 years kind of pointing fingers at the feds, <laughs> pointing mm -hmm. fingers at the provinces. I mean, from our take, you know, the federal government obviously has a role in setting those guiding principles, and probably most Canadians would agree with most of the principles in the Canada Health Act, right? If I could stick in Ontario, I don't want to be told that I'm not part of that insurance plan, therefore I, I'm not able to be treated. I think most of us would agree with most of the things in there. But we've really gotten to this point where, you know, the, the, the provinces have argued repeatedly, as was just said, this is their responsibility. And, and in the Canadian Constitution, health care is clearly the province's responsibility. Well, you know, to paraphrase the Spider-Man movie, with great power comes great responsibility. If you're going to own that, then it is up to you to reform it. And I think we're playing this game where they can hold off trying to make serious reforms because they can just get more money from the feds. And I think, honestly, that the, the provinces have to take responsibility for something that they say they own. They need to get into the hard work of figuring out what does the future of Canadian health care look like. All right. I want to get some reaction from the opposition parties. Uh, Marika, obviously, for the Liberals, this looks really good. It's a nice win. What are the opposition parties saying about this offer? The Liberals are sort of in the middle here, and I think they have cover because of that. The NDP say that the government should have actually spent even more than the massive amount that the provinces and territories were already asking for. They believe that Ottawa should increase its share of the cost to 50%, which should be tens of billions more each year. Meantime, the Conservatives, who are in official opposition, have not actually said, really, they never put forward their own proposals in advance of this announcement, these talks this week, but have said now that they will uphold what the Liberals offered in this 10-year deal if they form government. So there is maybe a bit more certainty for the Premier's as to what's next to come, but of course we'll have more elections before this 10-year deal is up. The Bloc Québécois believe that they, the federal government should have uh, met the premiers at their ask, which was to increase spending annually by $28 billion. So you see, you know, we're talking about these massive numbers and all of these questions go back to what Michael is talking about as to whether it's needed to actually reform the system and to lead to better results. I think most people agree you do need some money to make change, 
um, the question is, what is sustainable for Canadians? Rick, I want to stay with you. At the First Minister's press conference this week, Premier Ford uh, had used the analogy that this was a down payment. Now, I know housing prices in this in this country are quite expensive, but this was a little bit more than a down payment. I, 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 my question is, um, you know, is there a room for negotiation? Is Do we have an idea if the Premier is going to negotiate a better deal, or is this, this is it? There appears to be absolutely no room for negotiation in terms of the dollar amount. Where there might be room for negotiation and where the government says there is room for negotiation with the premiers is where the money is targeted within the health care system. So some of the money will be spent through the what's called the Canada Health Transfer, and that's the base funding that goes to provinces and territories that they can spend how they want to. And then there's other targeted funding that go, will go through separate deals. And it appears that there will be room for the premiers to negotiate where that money should be targeted. So, for example, in Nova Scotia, that means that a focus is on primary care because they have massive waits for family doctors and for family care teams. Similarly, in Ontario, it's expected that money could be targeted there. But there's other options to target it to mental health care, to home care, to long-term care, to wait times in surgeries and diagnostics. So there's sort of like a buffet, and the provinces and territories get to decide where that money in the side deals will go. Michael, as Marika had mentioned earlier, it's a bit of an equation in terms of how this money is going to be spent and where it can come from. Uh, should they accept this money or push for something more? Um, I mean, honestly, the, 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 the priorities that were just mentioned are exactly what my priorities are. So frankly, whatever money we can get right now, I, I am very supportive of. It'll help us whether we spread it out or whether we focus on one particular area. I do think, though, we need to get to the point where we have got to stop throwing money at our healthcare system. We have got to start asking difficult questions about what we can offer, what we can't offer. I think one of the big tragedies of Canadian healthcare is the fact that we have 13 systems that don't necessarily collaborate. Um, we should be looking at a lot more collaboration between provinces to try to decrease costs and at the same time, you know, centralize those high specialty, high cost services that we could centralize. Not every province has to have its own thing. There, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of provincial ego involved in this. There's a lot of duplication involved in this. And we just don't want to see more and more money put into the healthcare system without reform. It's more money and. And hopefully, if we do that, we will start to find some significant efficiencies in what we do. Because we just can't bankrupt the country especially for a system which is not really providing the service that Canadians want. Marika. I think uh, going off of that, you know, there's a question of political will from the premiers, and there's a question of if they actually want to do that reform. We know from other provinces' experiences that when they try to do wholesale change of the health care system, they experience a lot of pushback, a lot of fear, and it really pushes governments and, and puts risks to governments' sort of longevity in the next election. And so there's a lot of reasons from an electoral prospects perspective why governments don't necessarily want to enter into these whole scale change discussions. And the question is, how do you get past that? When you look at Nova Scotia, for example, a few years ago, they changed how their health system is organized through the health authorities. And that essentially um, slowed down and, and froze the system as it tried to adjust to the new way of doing things in a way that then hampered healthcare delivery in the meantime. And that caused a lot of problems for the then Liberal government at the next election. And so it's a question of how these provinces and these premiers can actually do this while keeping the current train running. It, it's, it's not an yeah. easy task that people are asking of the premiers, but it also doesn't seem that the premiers are that interested in it. Marika, I want to ask you uh, about one particular premier, one particular province, uh, Ontario. The, finish, the Financial mm -hmm. Accountability Office of Ontario says the province has allocated 12.5 billion in excess funds over the next three years while spending less in the required health care. Break it down a little. Is this government justified in spending less on health care? Well, that's not for me to answer, but certainly it, the federal government here has repeatedly pointed out that most of the provinces are currently sitting on budgetary surpluses <laughs> while the federal government is in deficit, right? So there is a question of a willingness to actually spend their own money versus going to Ottawa with an open hand. And that, I think, is, is a question then for voters. Pro 
premiers will respond to what voters are demanding of them. And so it's also on voters to show up and vote and to vote with their feet and show people what their priorities are. Clearly, we know there are surpluses now in provinces, but given the warnings of an economic slowdown, the pushback from the premiers is that they need long-term sustainable funding that they can depend on. And so fluctuations in a budget cycle do not necessarily mean you can build a whole new hospital because will you have the money five years down the road to run it? So there's arguments on both sides, but I think it's clear from that report from the financial accountability officer that more money could be coming from Ontario, at least for now. All right, Michael, we talked a little bit about sort of where uh, where the money needs to go, but what areas of the healthcare system need that money urgently? And I, I'm wondering if you have some examples as well as sort of that strain. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's 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 hard for people not in healthcare to understand how difficult the pandemic has been for healthcare workers. Um, you know, the whole population went through types of lockdowns and having to mask and things, but we, we've never left the pandemic. We're still masking, people are tired, et cetera. And so we have had a lot of people leave the system. So certainly health human resources are absolutely top of mind. And really there's no part of healthcare that doesn't require more people. The one that we talk a lot about is primary care, home care, uh, seniors care, those sorts of things, uh, mental health care. Those, there, there, there's a huge need right now to try to bolster those systems. At the same time, it's not like we're flush with hospital beds either, right? We have the lowest number of hospital beds per capita of any developed country. We are tied for the bottom with the NHS and the UK. So we have no resiliency in our system either. So when a premier says, give us however much money you want to give us, we can spend it. It's really kind of true. We are really patching multiple holes at once. And it really speaks to, although I fully understand the premiers don't want to go down that road, we're reaching a point where they're not going to have a choice. I think the public is going to speak with their feet, vote with their feet, and just say we're not, uh, we're not going to tolerate a mediocre health care system anymore at this point. Marika, what do the premiers want to use this money for? Is it primary care? Is it mental health services? And is there, are they in line with what the feds want to, or is there a discrepancy there? I think they, they are in line. I mean, the federal government, as I mentioned, yeah. has given them several options for where they can focus the money. It's not yet clear how these side deals will work out. Will the federal government expect that money will go to all of them, but that it will be weighted for different areas? But Francois Legault, the Quebec premier, who I would say is among the most staunch people opposed to any conditions on federal money, said that, you know, these are shared priorities. His priorities overlap with the federal government's priorities. So he has no issue dedicating that money to them. And we've heard a lot from healthcare professionals, and, and Michael can speak to this more, about the key of having a family physician to then access the medical system. And the wait times for family doctors are very high. In some parts of the country, more than a tenth of the population do not have access to them. So given that primary care is on the agenda for both the premiers and the federal government, you can see there's lots of overlap. The question is, what will be achieved with this money? What will the results be? And will voters and Canadians actually see a difference from it? Michael, I'll get you to respond as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, primary care is is a huge focus across the country. I mean, here in my province, we're, we're talking of a, a, a considerably higher uh, proportion than just 10 percent. And, you know, we're in the, in the middle of a uh, transition from solo practitioners into what we call patient medical homes, these group practices with uh, a wide variety of different healthcare professionals in them. That's clearly the future. That is requiring a lot of money. I mean, one of the challenges we are going to have, and other provinces may have as well, is that most of healthcare costs are people. And if there's a real shortage of those people internationally, we could have the money and not be able to move forward with it if we're not able to hire those people. And so, you know, it, it really is uh, a highly complex system where you've got 100 leaks at once and you're just trying to, you know, fix the airplane as we're, as we're flying it. I, I just think we're at a point where we, we, we truly need to do some, some foundational stuff and, and just throwing more money at it is not going to get us to where we want to go. I live in fear that, you know, come this summer or next summer, we're talking whole scale removal of services because we don't have enough staff and it's even less about the money than it is being able to hire the people. You know, that is terrifying for me, and it should be terrifying for Canadians because it's going to happen all across the country. 
All right, I want to play a clip of Dennis King, Premier of Prince Edward Island, at the First Minister's press conference from a few days ago. Have a look. I think what's lost in the conversations that we need to continue to focus upon is that it isn't just money that we need. We need uh, innovations. We need to change how we deliver health care. Uh, we need to help uh, innovate the health care system in many, many regards. And I feel the conversation over the last little while with, uh, uh, with the Council of the Federation and with the Prime Minister and with federal officials, uh, we've led maybe Canadians to believe that money simply is going to fix this, uh, and that is not totally accurate. Echoing exactly what both of you have been saying, I do want to pick up on, on one word there, innovation. Um, what innovations would you like to see in the healthcare system, Michael? You know, there, there's there's many. I mean, if we talk, I mean, first of all, that's why I love that guy and that's why I'm working in <laughs> PEI. I think we are very much aligned. Um, I do think, though, that, you know, Innovation doesn't have to always be technology, for example. So one innovation is this move away from solo practices into large group practices. Doctors are far happier there. They don't need to be the center of the universe, but rather their role can be to support all the other professions. Um, it leads to less burnout. It's easier when people go on holidays. That's one innovation. A lot of the um, uh, innovation here in Atlantic Canada has been around how can we collaborate on various things? So that really stands out in Prince Edward Island where we're not able to provide all the services you're gonna get in Ottawa. We just do not, we don't have cardiac surgeons, we don't have thoracic surgeons. So we are, we are forced to collaborate with other provinces. We can do a lot more of that, right? We're talking about having one license for all of Atlantic Canada. We're talking about breaking down barriers to allow uh, really Canadians who are training overseas, who right now all go to the US because we, we, we put up barriers to hire them. All of these things are kind of happening at the same time. So a lot of them are more business practice innovations rather than technology per se, but of course, electronic health records, gathering more data, uh, you know, proper use of virtual care so that we can get access to services we could never host in this province. All of those things are happening as we speak. Um, it's gonna take a few years for them to turn around, but we're, we're getting there. And it, I'm fortunate to have a, a government here that actually understands it's more than money. Rico, I'm going to get uh, you in there as well. When we talk about innovations, we, uh, you know, we talk about the data collection. I think that was one that both the feds and the province all agree on there. Um, and, you know, Michael touched on sort of why it's necessary. But when we talk about innovations, what can we potentially be seeing? Well, I, and, and maybe to, to be fair to the Premier, as you can tell from, from that quote from Premier King and from other Premiers, that they are aware of this issue. They, they do want to work towards it and do appear to want to provide better health care. But the cynic says, well, <laughs> you spent the last two years debating money instead of having these roundtable discussions maybe about that innovation that Michael's talking about, about that collaboration, about why is it that we have different credentials for each province across Canada and that it's not the same across. Um, so in terms of what innovation is, I can't speak to what it should be. That's really for Michael to say he is, he's the expert on the front lines. But we know that all premiers have agreed that it needs to happen, that there needs to be change. The question is, what do they actually do and how fast does that happen? All right. In the last two minutes, I got two questions for you, Michael. I'll come to you first. You know, as Canadians, this is healthcare is something that we are very proud of. Uh, but over the last couple of years, and obviously the years before that, we've seen the kinks and, and sort of the, the the shield has has some some damage to it. Um, should Canadians still be proud of their healthcare? I think that we should be proud that we have a a socialized healthcare system that's universal and it, and it is uh, transferable. And so we're not like the United States. However, I'm glad to see that the air has been let out of the great myth that we have the best healthcare system in the world. We don't. We have one of the worst performing healthcare systems in the world. And as long as we keep comparing ourselves to our American cousins, we don't look so bad. But if we compare anywhere else, we really don't don't look very good. So. I really believe Canadians should be proud that we have the spirit of helping other Canadians and our healthcare system is in dire need of reform. Marika, you get the last word here. What uh, are the next steps? What should we be looking out for? 
Well, very quickly, we'll see the premier's meeting on Monday to discuss this deal. And, and I, we know that the federal government wants these bilateral deals to target certain areas of health care to be in place within the next few weeks ahead of the budget cycles this spring. So I think that will be sealed up quite quickly. And then the question is, do the premiers continue this discussion? Or now that the money has been set aside, does the discussion stop? Marika, Michael, thank you so much for joining us on the program tonight. Really great stuff. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. In January, news emerged about the first potential burial site in Ontario of Indigenous people near a former residential school. And it's anticipated that many other such sites could exist. With us from Thunder Bay on how investigations into these places are carried out, Charnel Anderson, who covers the Northwest for Ontario Hubs. Hello, Charnel. Hey, Dan. All right, so tell us about the St. Mary's potential discovery. So last month, uh, on January 17th, actually, Wajuskonegum First Nation uh, became the first community in Ontario to announce that they found 171 anomalies or plausible burials within cemetery grounds associated with St. Mary's Residential School. And so Wajuskonegum um, is also known as Rat Portage. Uh, it's an Anishinaabe community just south of Kenora. And they had a residential school there that went by a handful of different names, uh, the latest being St. Mary's. And the school was operated by the Roman Catholic Church uh, uh, from 1897 to 1972, and according to the TRC, at least 36 uh, kids died while going to school there. While going to school there, um, their investigation, which started in May of last year, was led by the First Nation and two residential school survivor groups. Uh, together, they developed various protocols and principles. Um, Root in Anishinaabe culture to guide their investigation. And, you know, like other communities, they used um, archival evidence, uh, survivor testimony, and archaeological assessments to identify which sites to look at. And so using that system, um, along with ground penetrating radar, is how they identified these 171 plausible uh, grave sites. All right. So we have a couple of photos. Uh, tell us what we are looking at here. Yeah, so uh, this is a black and white image of the back of St. Mary's, which, um, as you can see, sat not far from the shoreline that um, I believe is Lake of the Woods there. And so that was built in 1897. Uh, it's a brick building with two or three floors. Um, there's a series of dormers along the roof. And I understand, actually, that site is not far from uh, the Devil's Gap Marina. And in that part of Lake of the Woods, uh, there's a bay called St. Mary's Bay. All right, and another photo here. And so, yeah, this is another black and white image. Um, that would be the front of the building that we just saw. Uh, the date says 1929. And there looks to be, you know, uh, 100 or more students, boys and girls, um, all lined up in front of the school. They're on the deck there, down the stairs, and in front of the school. And actually, you know, the school operated for 75 years. Uh, and during that time, more than 6,000 kids from 33 different communities uh, went or were taken there. So, Charnel, since 2021, when the unmarked graves were discovered in Kamloops, British Columbia, approximately how many sites have been looked at now? Yeah, so, I mean, obviously, since uh, the announcement out of Kamloops, um, you know, there's really been this reckoning, not, not just in Canada, but internationally, of the treatment um, and deaths of Indigenous children who attended, you know, these church-run, state-sponsored residential schools. And, um, you know, after Kamloops and Cowessis, these announcements that really resonated with the public, um, the federal and some provincial governments um, announced funding to help communities investigate potential grave sites. And I don't have a, pre a precise number, but there's been dozens of investigations into potential unmarked graves across much much of the country. Um, you know, they're all in different phases. Some communities have announced their findings, others have not. Um, but that's sort of the thing with this. You know, it's really an individualized process and every investigation is unique. Now, as you mentioned, there was national and global coverage and reaction to, to Kamloops. But I don't think a lot of people know this, that some discoveries uh, of unmarked graves were as long, like, were, were discovered as long as 1974. Uh, take us through a bit of the history of unmarked graves in this country. 
Yeah, I think, you know, this is something that sort of gets lost in the discussion of unmarked graves near residential schools. Um, you know, Kamloops got a lot of attention, but it was not the first site where potential unmarked graves were found or, you know, actual graves were found. Um, you know, so for example, just two years earlier in 2019, um, near Muskaugan Indian Residential School in Saskatchewan, a team of researchers identified 10 to 15 potential burial sites. Um, and as you say, this is the earliest investigation that I'm aware of um, in 1974 near Battleford Industrial School, also in Saskatchewan. Um, there, a group of anthropology students found, excavated, and restored over 70 grave sites uh, that were in an unregistered uh, cemetery. And <clears throat> Um, you know, there's been accidental discoveries, too, like at Dunbow Industrial School in Alberta, where in 1996, uh, there was a big flood that caused the river to swell, um, eroding the shoreline and exposing caskets and remains of the students who died and were buried there. Um, you know, for a long time, survivors have said that there's children buried near these schools. It's really only just recently, you know, that we started listening. In terms of the investigations, how are Indigenous-led and survivor-driven investigations different? So, you know, some of the older gravesite discoveries happened by accident, you know, whether that was flooding or construction um, in these areas. And when that happens, you really don't have a lot of time to decide what to do. But now, you know, communities are able to get together with survivors and other affected communities and decide collectively kind of what is the best way to undertake these investigations. You know, they can have conversations about what to do if or when they do find grave sites, you know, whether they want to leave the children where they're resting um, or to take them home. They can decide the best way to memorialize them. And, you know, they can take their time to do that because it's it's not something that you want to rush if you can help it. So, Charnel, talk to me a little bit about the challenges that come with these investigations. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's, you know, a number of practical challenges with these investigations. Um, I spoke with Kimberly Murray, who's uh, the independent special interlocutor um, for missing children and unmarked graves. And she's been meeting with indigenous communities across the country. And she says a lot of these communities are facing similar challenges, um, you know, when it comes to things like doing funding proposals or working with municipalities and private landowners. And then there's also the issue um, of accessing records. Uh, you know, she says that the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation and Library and Archives Canada has been slow to release records. Um, and, you know, those are just really some of the practical challenges. There's also emotional and spiritual and cultural aspects as well to this, which, um, you know, communities will have to find their way through as well. Now, very quickly, um, what's next in the process? Yeah, so I mean, for St. Mary's, they're continuing their search um, on other sites they've identified. They're seeking permission from landowners, private landowners, to search their properties. Um, the chief said they're looking at get, getting cadaver dogs uh, to help the community. But, you know, elsewhere, there's over two dozen active burial sites in Ontario. And I can't speak to, you know, where they're at exactly, mm -hmm. but I imagine those communities will make announcements if and when they're ready to. Charnel Anderson, thank you so much for joining us on the program. Very important stuff. Really appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks, Jan. The agenda this week heard from parents on what they say to their kids about anti-black racism, learned how economists untangle data, and spoke to political scientist Francis Fukuyama about liberalism. The agenda's week in review begins looking at the rise of online exploitation of children. Leanna, let's get to this. Why are we seeing increases in cyber crimes targeting youth in Ontario and across Canada, in your view? Well, I think there are a couple of reasons, uh, Steve. We're really in the perfect storm right now. Uh, when you look at the epidemic of COVID, kids spending more time online, um, isolated. Um, you also have access to platforms where we see adults having free access to children within those uh, environments. And also you have, you know, uh, child development. You have kids who are exploring um, their own sexuality. They're, you know, spending time online. And we have very sophisticated um, uh, networks of individuals who commit crimes against children. So basically, it, it really should not be a surprise to us. And then on top of it, uh, what we have is an unregulated Internet. Hmm. All right, Nora, can I get you to follow up on the COVID angle? How much has COVID been responsible for the uptick that we've seen? 
I think COVID has complicated and increased the risk for a number of reasons. Before COVID, children had multiple um, outlets or opportunities to socialize. They had uh, friends that they could go out with and hang out with, but we had to put an end to that during COVID. And so children were isolated and quite literally left to their own devices, which resulted in them starting to, you know, experiment much more online and um, probably engage in riskier behavior without perhaps gaining a full appreciation for the potential consequences. So when you have inabilities to engage socially or in person, they're trying to maintain that social engagement or interaction online using different platforms. It's another un unhealthy byproduct of COVID that perhaps some people didn't consider. Yes, it is. Huh. Okay, Michael, uh, lots of terms here that we need some clarification around. For example, uh, the offense of self-exploitation. What is that? Yeah, so essentially self-exploitation is we are having kids as young as four years old. Uh, they are on their electronics and they're on certain social media platforms. And as Leanna said, sometimes it could be that they're exper or experimenting with themselves or they inadvertently post images or videos of themselves online. There are four-year-olds with their own iPhones? iPhones, their own accounts, their own email accounts. They are very knowledgeable and very advanced to what you would think a four-year-old would know about the internet and devices. Do you have any advice to parents on the advisability of getting their four-year-old an iPhone and an and a Instagram account to boot? I would not recommend it. And <laughs> those that do have access to devices, I would recommend uh, overseeing them uh, quite a bit. Okay, Leanna, another expression here, sextortion. What is that? Basically, it's blackmail. What we're seeing is kids who are being targeted, they're being coerced or tricked into um, giving a, a sexual image of themselves typically um, is what's happening or video. Uh, what we know is we've got very sophisticated organized crime networks that are making a lot of money in this capacity. And uh, we have kids who are completely being duped. They think they, a young boy might think they're talking to a pretty girl. And basically within a short time frame, they're um, you know ex exchanging images. What happens very, very quickly is it, it turns to demands for money. And many of these organized groups are outside of North America. So it makes it incredibly complicated um, for law enforcement efforts. But more importantly, these kids don't stand a chance. And so um, it's really, really concerning. And since July alone, we've had 1,700 uh, reports come into us about sextortion. Oh, I got more on this. Hang on. Sheldon, uh, follow me here, if you would. Middle of page two. Uh, we have uh, a lot more facts to introduce to the record here. Stats gathered by the Canadian Centre for Child Protection about the increase in youth being sextorted, as the term goes. Uh, these numbers gathered between July 2022 and January 2023, so six-month period. Cybertip.ca currently receives an average of 70 sextortion reports per week. The national tip line received more than 1,700 sextortion reports in total. 91% of sextortion victims are male. Typically, boys are extorted for money, girls are extorted for images. Sextortion demands for money often come from international organized criminal networks, as Leanna was telling us. 79% of sextortion incidents occurred on Instagram or Snapchat. Uh, okay, Nora, we need some advice here. If you find yourself the victim of a sextortion attempt, what do you do? I think the most important thing is ensuring that um, they have a, a trusted individual that they could speak to. And I think one of our biggest efforts is to really remove the shame and blame that's associated with making mistakes. These are children and youth who are, as Leanne mentioned, experimenting. And they're experimenting in areas, in non-traditional areas. And, and um, the internet being what it is and, and being unregulated, it creates a whole other level of risk. So I think what we need to do is really focus on providing caregivers, parents, teachers, the tools they need to be able to engage in these conversations, to be able to identify these situations and proactively engage with children and youth on some of the risks and dangers associated with it. The talk evolves over years, over time, right? But at elementary school, it was the talk about how to keep himself 
understanding that black boys in school uh, diagnosis around ADHD, everything in school becomes a problem for black boys. Mm -hmm. Behaviors that are typically routine for mm -hmm. other kids becomes problematic for black boys. So they become disordered mm -hmm. within the school system. So I had to have those talks early on. But one of the things in the talk, I also think it's important that I have the talk with teachers so they understand what to expect of my black boy. So the talk's not just for kids, it's for others. Yes, because I think for too long we, we focused on, we need to keep our black boys safe, our black children safe, and that's unfortunate that we have to engage in this level of protection and safety just to keep them alive. And we should say, your, your son is one of the top divers in the whole country. Yes, he's he going is. To be, he's potentially going to be an Olympic level diver someday. Potentially, yes. Okay. Yet I'm having the talk because even his successes as an elite athlete doesn't keep him safe. Hmm. Okay, Earl, uh, we've set the table for you here, so come on in here and tell us about, in fact, if, if you could build on Kathy's answer, how the talk evolves over the years as children go from elementary school to high school, et cetera? Yeah, well, I think, you know, as a psychologist, we oftentimes talk about the need to be age appropriate with those conversations. So I think a big piece of it is, as kids are younger, you may be given a really basic, minimal information. And as they get older, you can have more of a dialogue and conversation with them about their own perceptions and experiences with the world. Um, and that's something that I oftentimes really talk with parents about is that you don't want to always sort of give your side a position on what you think uh, happens in terms of racial bias and that it really is helpful and important to understand how they see the world. So I, I think, you know, a point that was talked about earlier is, am I um, putting this fear in my child that may not be present when I have this conversation? And so I think, you know, one of the things that's really helpful is really opening up that dialogue to get their perceptions. You know, what has been their experiences based upon their skin color at school, in the community, playing sports, um, and then be able to go from there to give them the tools that they need to be able to navigate those different experiences that they may be having based upon those racial differences. Valine, could you pick up on the education angle as well that Kathy raised, namely that, you know, black kids may not be allowed to get away with as much bad behavior as white kids are allowed to get away with in schools. Yes. And there may, it may be a case that administrations or teachers see white kids acting a certain way and, and they don't, you know, they say, well, that's ADHD and we have to, you know, take a clinical approach to that, yeah. whereas it may be a more disciplinary approach for a black kid. Sure. How do you work that out? Uh, you know, Kathy made a very good point in making sure that you are present and you speak to your teachers, be involved, be involved in every aspect of their conversations. Um, and also making sure that even as a collective, speaking to other parents as well, any time that there is any kind of discord in the classroom, they need to know who you are, right? Um, I think too, a lot of um, black children overall, I'm gonna say girls as well, because of course I have the talk. You did not have the talk, but I had the talk. The you, talk from your parents, from my parents, namely my father. Um, part of that is also you spoke about behavior, but it's also academia. You have to work harder. You have to make sure that you work three times, five times, ten times harder than your counterpart. Because? Because of the color of your skin. Be Likely. Because the assumption is there's systemic racism in the school system. That's correct. And you have to make sure that you, you are seen. You are able to um, uh, achieve the same things that everyone else in the class is achieving. You're able to uh, show that you are capable, you're competent, you can excel in all areas of, of the academia or or curriculum as any other child. Kathy, how do you be present as a parent and advocate for your child effectively while at the same time not being labeled or targeted by the administration or the teachers of the school as that parent who complains <laughs> yes. all the time? Mm -hmm. I think it's really a tricky situation. One, one of the, we talk about presence and advocating for our children. Let's be clear that not all black parents have the capacity or the ability to be present and advocate. What we see oftentimes is many of our black parents 
in densely populated areas, they are working minimum wages, multiple jobs, can't make it to parent-teacher meetings, mm -hmm. can't give the phone call during school hours, and those kids get dinged. Those parents get labeled. It is not that they are unwilling or negligent of their children. It is that they do not have the capacity. But how do you, how do you balance between being a strong advocate for your child and not to being that parent, I'm okay with being that parent, right? <laughs> you don't mind, right. because if it's in the advocacy of your child, yes. be that parent. That's right, right, because the cost hmm. is too great hmm. to not be that parent. This is a graph, it's a line graph, from the years 2013 to now. It's about wages and costs, and it looks at a number of factors, you know, wages, labor force survey, accounts, payrolls, hours, productivity, and so on. And what we see in this chart, that with the exception of a big blip when COVID started, up, and then a big blip down, as we got about a year into COVID, it's a pretty flat line. Wages basically haven't done anything for the last decade. But then we saw this tweet from the University of Waterloo economist, Mikhail Skuterud, who said the following. Claim was real hourly wage growth has been stagnant. His chart shows 22% growth over 23 years. That's a 0.9% annual growth rate over 23 years. Real GDP per capita grew by 27% over same period. And he concludes, I don't think this is what people have in mind when they hear stagnant. And this graph shows the same line, but it's not flat. It looks more... Well, it looks like a kind of a short mountain, but it's going up from sort of bottom to top. It suggests wages are certainly more robust than the previous chart. And again, this chart goes back to 1998 to present day. So it goes further back and it shows a longer period of time. So we ask ourselves, what does all this mean? Who's right? Armin, start us off. Oh, okay. Um, first things first. Uh, wages were stagnant for about 20 years in the wake of the 81-82 recession and the 90-91 recession, almost zero wage growth. The first chart you showed showed roughly 3% wage growth every year, roughly, until the pandemic hit. And that chart comes from the Bank of Canada, which is really worried about wage price spirals taking off. In other words, people trying to catch up their wages to higher prices, which is the first time we've seen it since the 1980s. And we're not seeing any evidence as yet that wages are starting to spike in their pace of growth. Mikhail Skuterud's chart starts in 1998. That's roughly when wage stagnation ended. And he is right. It's the same as the previous chart, which just the Bank of Canada was just measuring annual growth, year over year growth every year. And it didn't really budge. But he is also right. Every year, if wages grow about 3% on average, then you are going to see a fairly interesting growth over time. You have to compare that, of course, to inflation. And you also have to take a look at whose wages are growing over time. Um, and I guess that's the end of what I have to contribute in this opening, Wally. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Trevin, pick that up if you will, because I appreciate Armin says basically the graphs say the same thing. But I look at one graph, and it's a pretty flat line, and I look at the other graph, and it looks like a ski hill. So how can they be saying the same thing? Yeah, I would agree is that uh, both graphs generally show the same thing. Um, so even though in the first graph, the line may look flat, uh, it, it's actually above zero. Uh, and so it's showing the growth rate each year being around two to three percent, meaning that wages are, are growing each year at a relatively consistent rate before the pandemic. Now, what we've seen since the pandemic, particularly in the last couple of years, is that even though wages themselves have been increasing is still, uh, they haven't been able to keep pace with inflation and, and price increases. So wages are going up, but you can't buy what you used to be able to buy for that price. Um, and probably where a number of economists would disagree is what happens from here, whether we go to that pre-pandemic trend or whether things have changed going forward. Okay. 
Benjamin, you've seen the two graphs. What do you pull from this? Yes, so let me share with you some trade secrets. Uh, you know, when you want to focus on something, you lower the scale, and the scale is very narrow, and then all of a sudden you see this mountain, and vice versa. You can zoom out, and then you don't see a flat. Those two charts basically telling you exactly the same thing. But they One, don't look anything alike. I know, and that's why you have to pay attention what it is. One of them is year over year rate of change. The rate of change, the other one is the level. The rate of change, as long as it is higher than zero, the level goes up. So focus on what they are giving you, year over year, change, or the level. It's basically the same chart, the same information. Extremely important, and what's not in this chart, is uh, who is getting this increase in wages or not. And we have to remember that this is average wage now and advice. The minute you hear the word average, be careful. Because, because, average, <laughs> because average is very confusing, because it's a composition of labor as well. If you have less people working in low-paying pay, industries, as we have seen during the pandemic, actually the average wage is going up, because you remove low wage, low productivity people from the equation. All of a sudden, we are more productive during the pandemic. No, we are not. But because of the fact that, unfortunately, most of the people that lost their jobs were low productivity, low wage, all of a sudden the stock was actually high wage, high productivity. Be careful here. You have to look at the composition. And then, okay, who is getting the increase? Low wage, high wage, the average is very misleading. Hmm. So we, 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 we really have to drill down deeper to that next level down to really understand what's going on here then. And that's why there's no clear, simple answer. The chart tells you only part of the story. <laughs> Uh, your fear that accomplished liberal societies feature, quote, a lack of purpose or a spiritual emptiness. Can you give us some advice on how we might deal with those two problems? Well, uh, you know, that goes to the essence of a liberal society. In, in a liberal society, we agree that we're going to disagree about the most important things. We're not going to define our uh, common aims in terms of a religious idea or you know, a, a very strong national idea because we live in pluralistic societies where people are able to do uh, what they want. And I think that, you know, the degree of pluralism that we have, especially here in North America, is such that it's hopeless to think that we're going to ever, you know, march in the same direction in terms of basic religious values or, or you know, we're, we're not simply one uh, ethnicity. And I think that, you know, in many respects, that becomes a strength. It, the, you know, it's kind of a cliche to say that our strength is in our diversity. But in fact, you know, the ability to absorb immigrants, to uh, actually create a society out of, you know, a very complex texture of ethnicities, races, uh, and the like uh, is, you know, something that I think becomes necessary as your economy and your society uh, develop. And so, you know, I think we find in a democratic society that our communal satisfaction is not given to us by the fact that we're like one people marching in one direction, but we still have community. You know, we can still exercise religious freedom. We can join the church of our choice. Uh, we can join private associations. You know, we have many alternatives for a communal life. It's simply not going to be one single uh, direction dictated by one single person at the top. And I think that, uh, you know, is a much more desirable expression of our in intrinsically social natures, you know, than an authoritarian regime provides. I have to tell you, from this side of the border, I, th I think it's fair to say most Canadians looking south at what's transpired in the United States over the past, well, let's say decade, but, but really I think most Canadians would say over the last five years, is a country that has been, um, you know, taken hostage by the extremists of both parties, um, probably more so by the extreme wing of the Republican Party than the Democrats. But having said that, as I watched the State of the Union last night and I saw a president of the United States from the Democrat Party uh, reaching out to shake hands with the Speaker of the House, the newly elected Speaker of the House, who's a Republican, and then after that, paying homage to the longest serving uh, Senate Minority Leader in American history and Mitch McConnell, that to me looked like potentially the beginning of a moment of more moderation and more reaching out. I don't want to be naive about this, but how did you see it? Uh, I, hope that, <laughs> I hope that that's correct. 
You know, I do think that the Republican Party has basically followed Donald Trump off of a cliff. Uh, you know, the future of that party and of the country as a whole cannot, you know, cannot lie in a preoccupation with this supposed stolen election back in 2020. And I think we've seen plenty of evidence that a lot of Republicans are kind of sick of that and think that they've got another agenda that is not being addressed uh, as a result of that. And so I do think that, you know, you're going to get a different kind of Republican candidate in the future that hopefully will return to, you know, the kind of real policy differences that existed between Republicans and Democrats that were serious, you know, differences of opinion about what we ought to do about immigration, about jobs, about a lot of different issues, and not this preoccupation, uh, you know, with kind of, <laughs> you know, the, the psychoses of one, you know, one particular uh, individual that's been leading the party. Uh, so, you know, maybe that will play out over the next couple of years before the 2024 election. We'll have to see. Uh, I guess the other thing, you know, since I was in Canada recently, I do think that part of the reason that the U.S. is so different from Canada really does have to do with its racial uh, history. I, I've always thought that, you know, if <laughs> somehow the Civil War had ended up differently and the South had gone off as a separate country, the United States, the rest of the United States would actually look a lot like Canada. But that didn't happen. We stayed a single country. And I think that that racial legacy has really very much shaped the politics and certainly lies at the base of a lot of the polarization that we are experiencing today. You know, the whole controversy over wokeness, which really started as a disagreement about how to interpret that racial history. And so, you know, our situations are different. I think you Canadians are perfectly right and scratching your heads and wondering, you know, what the hell's going on south of the border. Uh, I do that myself, but, you know, here we are. That's just some of what we've covered this week. You can find more, including the full conversations, on our website, tvo.org, our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda, or our Twitter feed, twitter.com slash the agenda. And that's it for this Friday, February 10th, 2023. Monday, historian and author Afua Cooper on the rich history of Toronto as a destination for thousands of those seeking freedom from slavery before the American Civil War. I'm Jane Jaganathan. Thanks for watching TBO and for joining us online at tvo.org. Have a great weekend, and Steve, we'll see you on Monday. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.